to Talking Business, a podcast in Melbourne, Australia. The podcast is available on the ACAST site, Mine website, the Apple Podcast Store, or wherever you go to get your podcasts. Or you can get it at the Business Acumen website at www.businessacumen.biz or at Banking Day. For the most exclusive access to leading economists and business leaders from around the world, subscribe to Talking Business from my website, leongetler.com. I am Leon Gettler. My job is to review and monitor the week's news in business, finance and economics. I bring it all to you every week. This is episode number 19 in our series for 2023, and today's date is Friday, June the 9th. First, I'll be talking to Dr. Sylvia Pfeiffer, CEO and co-founder of CoView, Australia's leading video telehealth solution and a spin-out of CSIRO's Data61. And I'll be talking to economist Nicholas Green, examining whether governments have actually created feel-good budgets. But now let's talk to Dr. Pfeiffer. Well, Sylvia... CoView is Australia's leading video telehealth solution provider and a spin-out of CSIRO's Data61. And during COVID, isn't it true that you saw something like a 4,000% increase in inquiries? 4,000%. Extraordinary! <laughs> yes, it's extraordinary. But uh, telehealth has given the... Uh, uh, pand- the pandemic has given telehealth a real kick, a kick in the, you know, behind... Um, <laughs> It's really uh, pushed it up and and uh, made it uh, something that everyone started embracing. So all the objections that were uh, held against telehealth before the pandemic uh, uh, all fell away during the pandemic and, and both patients and clinicians embraced it and, and said, OK, we have to get the virus under control. We have to stay away from each other. And, and telehealth was just the right way to do it. You would have it in every area, not not just also in terms of seeing GPs, but also in terms of counselling and psychiatric services as well, wouldn't you? Absolutely. So Coview, um, my my company, is a, a video telehealth platform. So we provide um, a video platform, not a dis, dissimilar to to Zoom or or Skype or any of these other platforms that you might know, but it's custom made for healthcare. So it allows clinicians to offer video consultations consultations to their patients. Uh, and that includes GPs, uh, mental health practitioners, physical therapy practitioners, dietitians, nutritionists, um, you name it, e- essentially specialists as well, essentially any, any kind of specialty can offer video consultations to their patients. Well, there's been a real mind- shift in the mindset, isn't there? I mean, suddenly Australians are suddenly accepting telehealth as a way to go. Is that right? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's not just accepting it. Uh, Patients have gotten a real taste for it through the pandemic. Uh, Think of a family like um, a mother with three children. One child is sick and having to go to to, to, to all kinds of efforts to get uh, somebody to look after the children while she takes one of them to the doctor and gets all of that organized. How much easier is it to just do a video call with your GP? And uh, um, we've seen that over and over again that uh, patients have loved the simplicity with which they can go and see a, 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 a clinician online. You've done some research, haven't you? Saying, showing that Australians are demanding a more flexible healthcare system for the future. Is that right? Yes, yes. We have done uh, c- consumer research or patient research. We've uh, undertaken this with an independent uh, organization, uh, Pure Profile. So it wasn't done by us. It was done by a, a, a consumer research uh, group. And they asked uh, 1,007 Australians uh, about um, their preferences around video telehealth and whether they've got experience with telehealth or whether um, uh, and what they think about it. Um, and one of the key results that we saw was that, you know, 70% of Australians think that all GPs should offer video telehealth. So uh, lots of Australians have seen the introduction of telehealth and uh, lots of them have have embraced it and 70% want it to be available by every single GP. How does that play across your demographics? Is that with Gen Xs or is it across everyone? It's across everyone. And one of the uh, key insights that we, we had from the questionnaire was that Uh, All the uh, Australians have actually embraced technology as well. I believe that must have happened during the year, uh, uh, during the pandemic. But we've also seen older Australians really embracing technology um, uh, nowadays anyway, because they like to stay in contact with their grandchildren via video, you know. So there's there's a lot of uh, capability and capacity in, in our system now. Uh, and it's across it's across the age groups that they want uh, want to see their clinicians via video. How many would actually switch GPs ah, or doctors? A, that is a very good question. 
Um, so uh, the, the question really is, um, are they going to vote with their feet uh, for getting, getting what they have, what they desire? And uh, we did ask that question, would, would Australians prefer to go to a GP that offers video telehealth over one that doesn't? And would they actually switch? And 44% of Australians said they would switch if given the choice between a, a GP, a local GP that offers video telehealth and one that doesn't, they would switch to the one that offers video telehealth, 44%. So how does it play across ages? Uh, it's quite similar again. Um, the, uh, uh, the younger people here are probably a bit less committed to their existing GP than the older people, but it's, it's quite similar across age groups here as well. So, uh, you know, people say 18 to 34 would be more likely to switch to GPs. Yes, 18 to 34 is, is uh, more likely to, to, to switch GPs. But, uh, but anyway, across all adults as well. Across all adults. Would that be also include older Australians? Um, absolutely. I, uh, we've, we've got some real good experience with, with uh, older Australians that um, have picked up uh, telehealth even uh, you know, some people as old as, uh, you know, 99, 100 years old that have actually embraced uh, video telehealth because they found it so much easier than having to organize getting to a GP, asking a family member to go or to, to take them. You know, there's, there's, there's a lot of opportunity also in, in, age, in, in, in age care for home care or residential age care where uh, we can support via video telehealth, we can increase the support of, of our older population. So uh, absolutely, there's, there's a lot of interest. So uh, you can actually make it more available in aged care homes. Is that right? Yes, yes absolutely. Well, can you explain how that would work? Yes. So right now, if you've got people in aged care centres and they need to see, in, see their, their clinician, at the moment, the GPs would need to travel out to them. And often the GPs don't have a lot of time. Uh, they go through in a rush and, and they, they might not come often enough, particularly not when, when it's actually necessary for the patient to see a GP. So with video telehealth, if a video telehealth can, can be introduced, let's say in a residential aged care center, then they can just make an appointment when it's needed for them. Uh, without waiting for the next uh, regular doctor visit uh, to come to the to, 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 to the year centre. So are older patients or older residents of aged care homes quite okay with that? It, uh, it's, it's actually not so much an age problem, whether people like telehealth or not. It's more a personal preference problem. Some people are just very good with picking up technology and feeling comfortable talking on video uh, and, and other people just cannot cannot deal with it. They absolutely have to go and see their clinicians in face to face. So so from where where I stand and from our experience, it really depends on the patient um, and on the patient clinician relationship, whether uh, whether the, you know, a phone modality or in person or a video modality is the best way to interact with your with your clinician. So, I mean, how many telehealth consultations do you do a month? We do about 150,000 consultations a month still. During the pandemic, we did uh, almost 25,000 a day, uh, which is extraordinary. That's over 3 million, uh, you know, face-to-face -face meetings of people that we have avoided during the pandemic. Um, and so we're quite proud that we've helped uh, Australia in curbing, curbing the pandemic. We think we've contributed our little bit for it as well. Okay, and uh, given that uh, we're not out of the COVID situation yet, and chances are it's going to be around for some time. Look, I don't know where we're going to go with COVID. I don't know if we're ever really going to get rid of it again or whether we just have to all learn to live uh, with it. Um, you know, maybe, maybe there'll be annual vaccinations. Uh, maybe there'll be people that just cannot take the vaccination and they have to isolate themselves quite frequently when, when there's another outbreak. I don't know how we're going to go with the, with the, with the virus going forwards, but um, you're quite right in saying, you know, telehealth is, uh, is an opportunity to help us manage these situations. When there's a new outbreak, we can always go back to telehealth uh, for everyone and, and, and reduce uh, the amount of uh, interperson contact. But telehealth is actually more than just for a, for a pandemic situation. It is useful for, for, a, uh, um, you know, for your day-to-day -day contacts with your clinicians as well. Well, I would say that's probably the way of the future. Would you agree with that? 
Absolutely, absolutely the way of the future. Uh, healthcare is changing just like every other vertical has changed. Every other industry has changed. Healthcare is also changing. Uh, we're embracing technology much more. Video telehealth is just one start. It's the beginning of a transformation in, in healthcare where digital technology will, will really make a difference to how we, uh, how we experience tech, uh, uh, healthcare in the future. Well, Sylvia, that's fascinating stuff. And thank you very much for your time. Anytime. Very nice. Thank you for having me on your program. And now let's talk to economist Nicholas Gruden. Let's, let's talk about the well-being budgets that have been coming out. Uh, Jacinda Ardern had her well-being budget. Now this government has talked about well-being. Uh, plenty of Australian state governments talk talking this way too. What do you think that's behind it? Well, it goes back to 1968 at least, where Bobby Kennedy is very famous, uh, very famously said, we measure everything except the, uh, you know, the our kindness uh, there. We, we measure... Uh, GDP captures the cost of all our weapons and all the pollution we produce, but it doesn't capture uh, the way we care for each other and all that sort of stuff. So it's a year. It's quite a deep yearning that we have. We all get the idea that man does not live by bread alone, and uh, so this is a an attempt to do something about that. So whether you know how successful it is or not is another question but that's kind of where it's coming from i think so what did you make of the new zealand well-being budget i don't think it was a well-being budget it was a well-being themed budget so if you're organizing a ball you say to yourself what's the theme uh, you might it might be pirates and everyone comes with a eye patch and a parrot on their shoulder the if it was a well-being budget it would be a budget in which there was some real detectable methodology for identifying what should be done and what shouldn't be done. Now, what happened was Jacinda Ardern came along and she was very keen on this stuff. And in fact, the New Zealand Treasury had been working quite seriously on metrics for well-being, but they didn't connect up. They didn't, there was no real connection between the metrics and the priorities in the budget. And instead, that was handled by way of themes, which you'd be familiar with from PR. So the government announced that it was a well-being budget, and then they came up with five themes that they thought were kind of associated well with well-being. Some of them sound like they are. They didn't demonstrate that they were the highest priorities for well-being, but they were improving child well-being, a particularly welcome thing on... Uh, child poverty, whether uh, how uh, whether that's particularly the most effective thing we can do on well-being, it was left unsaid, supporting mental health, that sounds good. Then backing Indigenous people, well, it sounds good. Is that a well-being priority? Perhaps. Uh, creating opportunities is the next one. And then boosting innovation. Now, boosting innovation would have been in the budget anyway. So I think it's a kind of re, it becomes a kind of reskinning operation rather than taking the opportunity to think differently and to build different systems to say we are now going to prioritize well-being ahead of other things like GDP for instance. So how are we going about it? So what we're doing in Australia is pretty much up for grabs. We know that the uh, Treasurer, Jim Chalmers, has, has made a couple of statements. He described the first budget, not the one he's just released, but the first budget as the first of a, 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 a as a well-being budget of some kind. And he announced that there would, would that more attention would be given to measurement. He's subsequently released a statement about that measurement, and we're going to hear more of that. There's more consult consultation going on at the moment. That can't do any harm, but uh, it's one of the things that governments do a lot when they're not quite sure what to do is they try and get more information. It's like saying that if we've got a problem, if people are getting ripped off or something like that, we'll, we'll pursue a transparency agenda where everyone knows exactly what they're doing. So this is a, a kind of a well-being transparency agenda. It's still pretty silent on how we're going to improve well-being. So what's missing and how can we do a better job? So I think the most important thing, and, and I've been quite disappointed with some discussion, for instance, the 
uh, Center for Policy Development put out a discussion paper and it had lots of it said lots of nice things about well-being and all the important things to measure but they didn't mention that the most important thing is to build a system of measurement that helps you improve well-being knowing the level of well-being in some detail is a nice thing to know but it's not nearly as important as learning how to improve well-being right now in new zealand the new the the new zealand system is becoming has they're building a quite sophisticated system which in principle would be able to tell you the level of self-reported well-being say of maori say of indigenous people in new zealand in Rotorua or Christchurch, but all of that work doesn't give them any new insights into how to improve well-being. So that's critical. And the other thing we could do with well-being is we could just ask ourselves the sort of simple, practical questions. I could call them economic questions, but they're they're just practical questions, which we did at the beginning of the greenhouse agenda. And what did we talk about when we when we started talking about lowering our emissions, we talked about cost curves. We talked about no regrets measures. That is the lowest hanging fruit. What could we do to reduce emissions that actually won't cost us any money? There are plenty of things we could do in well-being like that. I've given some examples. I think one of the best examples is that there are, the, if you look at the, the, the subpopulations in Australia with very depressed well-being, the subpopulation, which is large, and I think could have their well-being improved substantially at, at minimal cost, is carers who are getting on and their spouse is now disabled and they become socially isolated. And we could deal with that with, with local programs to connect them to community and so on. That's just one example. But there are there are plenty of others, and that's what a real well that's what would happen i like it's basic common sense that's what would happen if a well-being agenda wasn't just some nice things for people to say but a, a project an, a project to make things better for people who are who, who are suffering right now and who we can do at at quite minimal cost that would require the assistance of state councils, the state governments and, and, and local councils as well. Well, indeed it would, like most of the, you would expect that for the sort of issue that we're talking about, but I've been talking to state governments. There are a number of state governments who are producing well-being frameworks and this compulsion, <laughs> this compulsion of organisations to produce frameworks before they do anything is a terrible curse. And and in fact, I was in a meeting with the state treasury and they said, well, we need a well-being framework. And I said, I've just given you a well-being framework. It's called a cost curve. Go looking for areas where at minimal cost you can improve well-being the most. That's a framework. But instead they want, you know, a hundred indicators and and uh, dashboards and all this kind of stuff. And that won't actually improve our well-being i hate to break it to you but uh, that's pretty obvious well there's a whole lot of uh, well-being issues like you've got carers loneliness you've got the better approaches to out of home care well uh, so the the very worst cases of which there are thousands in australia hundreds in most in in populous states are kids who have been taken off their parents for abuse and neglect the systems of foster care they go into are terrible. And the very worst of those, say the bottom 10, the, the worst 10% have been moved from one foster carer to another. Many of them now live in hotels in round the clock supervision. This costs us $500,000 or more per child. And it's a kind of velvet gulag. <laughs> Um, and it, guess what? It's not good for anyone's well-being in this system. And we could save ourselves plenty of money and improve well-being if we were serious about this agenda of uh, embracing 
well-being as well as GDP as one of the things we want to manage for in our government systems and government policy. So instead of building a framework, you first identify which areas need attending. Well, that would be my framework. My framework would be an action, a framework that was a scaffolding for action. And if you're going to take action, then obviously you want to gear up to take the most cost-effective action as the as the highest priority. So that's what my framework would produce, and it would produce it quickly. And then the actual framework would mature along with the policies and the programs because it would be the policies and the programs that would generate the information that would make the framework make more sense than just be a nice thing to put up on the wall or in a PowerPoint presentation. Well, Nicholas, that's all quite illuminating. And thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Leon. So what's happening in the news? Well, the Treasurer Jim Chalmers has signed the Czech's death warrant to end its use in Australia by 2030 as part of a range of payment reforms to the digital era. In a speech delivered to the Australian Banking Association in Sydney on Wednesday, Chalmers said there'd been a 90% decline in the use of cheques over the past 10 years alone, but it remains a legacy payment method, while other economies have transitioned to digital payments. Chalmers said that 98% of personal cheques and 100% of those used in institutional and commercial settings could be serviced through internet or mobile banking, and that using cheques is a more costly way of doing business. The government will now begin the process of winding down the use of cheques across the banking system, with federal government's departments to use other payment methods by 2028. A goal has been set to end the use of cheques completely in 2030. And new data has revealed the growth of Australia's misery index is almost as high as it was during the global financial crisis due to climbing inflation and interest rates. During 2022, the index jumped by almost 220% compared to a 62% increase in the 12 months of the start of the GSC in 2007-2008. The index has tracked inflation, interest rates and unemployment in Australia since the 1960s. The analysis by University of Melbourne economist Guy Lim and Sam Tsiaplias showed the index would likely remain high for some time. Despite inflation retreating slightly in recent months, the unemployment rate and interest rates had continued to rise. And the Reserve Bank has lifted its official interest rate to 4.1%. The cash rate is currently at its highest level since April 2012. The bank's board decided to lift the cash rate target by 0.25 of a percentage point. RBA Governor Philip Lowe said some further tightening of monetary policy may be required. The RBA is particularly concerned about the stickiness of inflation, particularly in the service sector. Domestic sources of inflation appear to be holding up, even as foreign sources of inflation start to subside. If high inflation becomes entrenched in expectations, then it will require aggressive hiking above and beyond what we've seen thus far to contain. The most recent monthly consumer price index from the Australian Bureau of Statistics showed prices rose 6.8% over the year to April, up from the March reading due to some statistical noise caused by last year's temporary fuel excise cut. And PricewaterhouseCoopers has identified a list of 76 current or former partners associated with the tax leak scandal, handing over their names to Australian lawmakers. We've heard the calls from our stakeholders to release the names of those who are responsible for confidentiality breaches, and we've been working as quickly as possible to determine that and to disclose those names to the Senate per their request, and we've now done so. PwC Australia Acting Chief Executive Officer Christine Stubbins said in a statement on Monday. In an email to partners on Monday, Stubbins said former partners Michael Burston, Peter Collins, Neil Fuller and Paul McNabb were involved in breaching confidentiality. Stubbins added that the names of nine others who were placed on leave last week have been provided to a Senate committee and promised to take appropriate action. The firm also handed over a list of an additional 63 current or former partners and staff who received at least one email containing confidential information, noting those people may not have been aware of the confidentiality breach. The Australian arm of the global consulting giant has been under pressure following revelations that a former senior partner obtained confidential tax policy information while advising the government and the firm, then used it to advise global clients. The firm stands to lose millions of dollars in revenue thanks to its breach as clients review their relationship with the consultant. And the entire business community, including miners and farmers, has declared war on the Albanese government over its proposed labour hire laws, arguing the changes will remove reward for effort and ultimately stifle wage and business growth. In the biggest joint campaign of its time, Eight peak organisations have launched a multi-million dollar campaign 
which they vow will run indefinitely if need be, and which mocks the government's simplistic sales pitch that cracking down on the use of labour hire was about same job, same pay. The laws will spearhead the government's second wave of industrial relations reform to be introduced in the latter half of the year, and which also includes a crackdown on the gig economy, measures to reduce the use of casuals and criminalising wage theft. Business and industry groups, which feel they were used as props by the government at last year's job summit, which produced the first wave of IR changes, including multi-employer bargains, say they're going to stand and fight this time. The campaign argues the IR agenda, like the first wave, is a union agenda, and the consultation process on labour, which has been going for months, has been a sham. And Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese expects an upgrade in diplomatic relations between his country and Vietnam to a comprehensive strategic partnership soon, he said during his first visit to the Southeast Asian country. Australia and Vietnam are targeting to boost bilateral trade to $20 billion. Last year, their trade was about $15.7 billion, according to Vietnam's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The cooperation agreements include establishing ministerial-level trade talks and exchanging intelligence sharing on money laundering and terrorism financing. Albanese, who met senior government officials and Communist Party chief Nguyen Phu Trong, announced a $105 million assistance package to support Vietnam's transition away from coal. Australia has signed comprehensive strategic partnership agreements with several other Southeast Asian nations in the past decade, including Indonesia, Singapore and the ASEAN grouping. Both Australia and Vietnam had previously expressed a hope to elevate their relationship to a similar level by 2023. Vietnam is an important part of Australia's ongoing policy of trade diversification, which ramped up in recent years following a decision by the Chinese government to place sanctions on a range of Australian agricultural products, such as wine and barley. Vietnam has since become an important new destination for Australia's barley, making up 13% of the country's entire barley exports in the financial year ending June 2021. The country's competition regulator says the federal government should establish an independent agency to deal with consumer complaints against airlines and has urged not to wait until next year to act on the growing dissatisfaction surrounding flight cancellations and delays. Gina Cascotley, in a most direct intervention into the debate about airline performance and profit, also said that carriers should be fined for cancelling flights and made to compensate passengers, as is the case under European rules. Customer frustration remains high in the airline industry, even as the pandemic-induced pressures on fares and the staff shortages of forced car flight cancellations recede. The rate of delays and cancellations remains well above average, and smaller local airlines and international carriers, say Qantas and Virgin Australia, are locking them out of routes. We can see enough of a sustained level of failure on service reliability and the level of complaints from customers that we think there should be a definitive, independent and external scheme that will hold them to account, Ms Katzbottleib said. The Australian Competition and Consumer Commission had first called for airlines to face financial penalties for flight cancellations as part of its submission to a review into how demand for gate access was managed at the Sydney airport. Industry sources complain that both Virgin and Qantas rotate flight cancellations among their services to avoid breaching the 80% threshold at which a slot will be surrendered. The federal government is due to release a broader policy proposal for the industry next year, but Ms Cascott Loop said Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development Minister Catherine King could act to establish an aviation sector ombudsman this year. And the competition watchdog has called for carriers to pass on fallen fuel costs via ticket prices as it warned consumers are not being served well enough by domestic airlines. In its final airline monitoring report, the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission said there was evidence market domination by Qantas and Virgin Australia was hurting customers with service reliability worse, fares higher than in 2019. At the same time, airline costs have reduced, jet fuel has almost halved in price, and we're hoping to see those reduced costs passed on, ACCC Chair Gina cascott Leib said. In the current cost of living environment, we think that is why we're starting to see some falling off of what were very high levels of pent-up customer interests to fly because price levels are just too high for many families to afford. The ACCC report made the point that domestic passenger numbers in the normally busy month of April actually declined from the previous month and remained below 2019 levels. Ms Cascott Leib also raised concerns about the market domination of the Qantas and Virgin Australia groups, which carried 94% of all domestic travellers. And the Australian government is looking for a way forward to compensate families of victims of alleged war crimes in Afghanistan, the Defence Minister has told legal advocates. But officials continue to warn about the complexity of the compensation issue, one of the key outstanding recommendations from the landmark Brereton inquiry into alleged war crimes by Australian Special Forces soldiers. Human rights and legal groups have stepped up their calls for a compensation plan in the wake of Thursday's federal court ruling, dismissing the defamation case brought by former Australian soldier Ben Robert Smith. The government has not commented on the case itself. 
saying it is not party to the civil proceedings, but has restated its commitment to acting on the Brereton report. The four-year-long inquiry by Major General Paul Brereton found credible information to implicate 25 current or former Australian Special Forces personnel in the alleged unlawful killing of 39 individuals and the cruel treatment of two others. Burton's report said Australia need not wait for a court to establish criminal liability before making compensation payments. He argued if there was credible information for an of an unlawful killing, it was simply the morally right thing to do to pay compensation swiftly. He also said such steps would help restore Australia's standing. The government is working through options on the issue of compensation but has yet to make a decision. The Defence Minister Richard Miles emphasised his personal commitment to action in a letter to the Australian Centre for International Justice, a not-for-profit legal centre that aims to combat impunity. Miles told the group that since taking office, he had made it a priority to engage with defence on the implementation of all the recommendations arising from the Afghanistan inquiry. And as excitement around artificial intelligence explodes, the National Science Agency, CSIRO, and fund manager Affinity Investment Management have joined forces to build a framework to help investors identify responsible AI. While environmental, social and governance, ESG, investing has become a core framework for many investors, CSIRO Research Director Liming Zhu says the rapid growth of AI has left gaps in the understanding of how the technology should be considered in line with ESG frameworks. Responsible artificial intelligence is a practice of developing and using AI systems in a way that provides benefits to individuals, groups and wider society while minimising the risk of negative consequences. Affinity's head of AS ESG and sustainability, Jessica Cairns, said discussions about AI and its ethical implications in the firm began two years ago as it had big technology names such as Google, Microsoft and Apple in its portfolio, but AI risks and opportunities have since become increasingly relevant to sectors beyond IT. While Ken said there were significant benefits to integrating AI into businesses, including greater access to information and increased business efficiency, the technology posed substantial risks both to businesses directly and to the systems within which they operate. Most sectors are using AI in one form or another, but Keynes pinpointed the financial services industry as one of the most interesting users, with banks harnessing AI to power processes such as credit scoring, pre-application screening, transaction monitoring and fraud detection. And the country's big four banks are set to shed tens of thousands of jobs in coming years as generative artificial intelligence takes over more of their core operations from approving home and small business loans to handling standard foreign currency transactions. How do we know this? Because ChatGPT, the most famous generative AI application, said so. When asked how AI would affect the financial services industry, ChatGPT noted, AI technologies can automate various tasks and processes in financial services, such as data entry, document processing, customer support, and fraud detection. This automation, it added, improves efficiency, reduces errors, and allows employers to focus on more complex and value-added activities. ChatGPT clearly sees a role for AI in enhancing the customer experience. AI-powered chatbots and virtual assistants can, can, can provide personalised customer support, answer inquiries and handle routine transactions, it said. AI also has a role to play in financial risk assessment and fraud detection. According to ChatGPT, AI algorithms can analyse large volumes of financial data to identify patterns and anomalies that may indicate fraudulent activities. But the more sensitive issue for the country's banks is that AI can be used in their core lending operations, eliminating or reducing the need for loan assessment officers. It's hardly surprising that when asked which jobs were most at risk from AI, ChatGPT nominated data entry clerks, customer support representatives, risk analysts, loan underwriters, those working on the trading floor, as well as those involved in back office operations such as fraud detections and compliance checks. Still, ChatGPT was modest enough to concede that while AI can automate certain aspects of these roles, it often augments human capabilities rather than completely replacing them. As a result, Many banking jobs will continue to require human skills such as critical thinking, complex problem solving, relationship management and decision making, which AI currently struggles to replicate. And Australian universities have produced their worst financial results in history with a combined $1.3 billion loss with only five of the 29 that have reported their 2022 accounts being in surplus and only one improving its financial position on the year prior. Experts put the extreme volatility down to the COVID-19 pandemic, which had a dire impact on international student revenues in some, but not all, universities. The pandemic also spurred on opportunistic job redundancies and cost-cutting, which drove surpluses in 2020-21. But having shed an estimated 27,000 jobs in 2021, most institutions were forced to rehire staff in 2022, as campus life and in-person teaching resumed some level of normality. 
Only one of New South Wales' 10 universities was in surplus in 2022. The University of Sydney was in the black to the tune of $302 million, but that was $700 million less than its 2021 surplus. A similar picture emerged in Victoria, where only one university, La Trobe, posted a surplus of $38 million. However, because of a quirk of accounting protocols in the higher education sector, the Count's one-off grants and payments, such as for research and philanthropy, in the net result, La Trobe only made it into the black thanks to a $45 million donation to autism research. However, severe deficits have also not had much influence on vice-chancellor's salaries. Ten vice-chancellors earned $1 million plus salaries in 2022, with the University of Melbourne's Duncan Maskell the most highly remunerated with a package of $1.5 million unchanged from 2021. Five of the ten vice-chancellors earning more than $1 million are female. Those who received the highest pay jumps were John Dewa at La Trobe, Alex Cameron at RMIT, Patricia Davidson at Wollongong, Alex Zielinski at Newcastle, and Harleen Hain at Curtin. And as a swag of polls show support for the voice is faltering, an increasing number of corporations have declared they will take an impartial position on the referendum, in, in, in contrast to the supportive stance many took for the 2017 marriage equality postal vote. Companies such as Orica, Energy Australia and Dow Chemical will not advocate the support of an Indigenous voice to Parliament, but have vowed to inform employers about constitutional change and to equip them to have respectful debates about Indigenous reconciliation. Westpac emerged as the only corporate heavyweight to publicly advocate a yes vote in the upcoming referendum, with institutional back chief executive Anthony Miller calling the voice a leadership moment for Australia's oldest bank. However, many other leaders said their outfits were still considering whether they would take a position, but all felt a sense of responsibility to help employees inform themselves about the choice they had to make. And mortgage arrears are climbing as borrowers run down their savings and collide with the tighter refinancing market that has escalated financial stress, S&P Global says. The credit ratings agency observed that arrears in residential mortgage-backed securities rose notably for both prime and less stable non-conforming securities, attributed to rising interest rates and cost of living pressures weight on debt serviceability. The worst hot spots for arrears in New South Wales are the Blue Mountain suburb of Katoomba, 5.6% of loans in arrears, the Sydney suburbs of Bonnery, 4.9%, Dolls Point, 4.9%, and Alloway, 4%, and the Southern Highlands suburb of Alpine, 4.5%. Forest Field in Western Australia, 4.9%, Avoca Dell in South Australia, 4.1%, and Barclay in Queensland, 4%, underperformed. In Victoria, Broadmeadows, 4.1%, and West Melbourne, 4.2%, stood out for arrears. And that's it for this week. And next week, I'll be talking to filmmaker Michael Budd, who will talk about how he managed film production during the pandemic. And I'll be talking to Comsec Chief Economist Craig James about market trends for the week. In the meantime, catch me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn and YouTube. And if you want, leave a comment. For the most exclusive access to leading economists and business leaders from around the world, subscribe to Talking Business on the Apple Podcast Store or on my website, leongetler.com. If you want to contact me, email me at leon at leongetler.com. I answer all emails. Wishing you all a...